Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. Last week, we started on the deity of the Holy Spirit. And uh, you know, before we had been talking about the person and work with the person of the Holy Spirit, he was a person. Last week, we got into the, what kind of person is the Holy Spirit. And we started down the five distinct lines of proof in the Old and New Testament that the Holy Spirit is deity. He's divine. He's, a, he's, he's, he's God. And last week, we started with the four divine attributes of God that are ascribed to the Holy Spirit and got hung up at omniscience, 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 where we start talking about he'll show you things to come. And we just kind of got over there and never got back from there. That's okay because that's good. God does show us things to come. Amen? Now, he might show you things to come later when you want to be shown to you, but he'll show you things to come. Sometimes we want it all backed out ahead of time. Can you imagine if Abraham, the Lord said, get thee out of that country, get thee out of that house, from thy father's house, and go into a place that I will show you. And Abraham said, yeah, that's pretty good, but I want to map where we're going before I leave. <clears throat> Amen. You know, it's like kids in the car. You know, you're going to go on a trip. Now, you take off, you know, Tulsa's an easy trip. You pretty much get on 40 West till you get to the Muskogee Turnpike and go north. And there's Tulsa. Not a whole lot of turns. You know what I'm saying? It's... But the kids will ask you every 20 miles, how much further? Are we ever going to get there? Well, after 16 hours in the car, everybody starts wondering if you're ever going to get there. Your backside's really wondering if you're ever going to get there. But you know, you just tell the kids, hey, I know what I'm doing. Trust me, we're going to get there. We've got to learn to trust God that he's leading us where he wants us to go. He, kn he knows where he's leading you to. Now, a lot of people don't like following when they don't know where they're going. You ever been, on, you know, you ever been in, a, in a car? I, I know I'm coming. I'm trying to tie in last week and then bring it this way. Ever been in a car behind a tractor trailer and you couldn't see anything? You had to trust that tractor trailer knew where he was going. Amen? I remember the very first trip that we took to Tulsa, Janie and I, we had my old uh, demon-possessed car, the AMC Gremlin. I looked at Gremlin one day in the thesaurus, and it said demon. You know? And I had little demons all over the car. Demon car, demon car. It was a demon car. There was a windshield wiper demon in that car. Had the old vacuum windshield wipers, and it had a hole in the hose somewhere. And so you turn it off. You built up enough stuff, stuff. Turn it on, and it goes, Shoop. that was it. You had to turn it off. So I rode one time, like six hours, Leaned over, turning it on, turning it off, turning it on, turning it off, turning it on, so I could see where I was going. You know, when you're young, you didn't have any money, and you thought you knew everything about faith, but you didn't. So our first trip, we drove from Greenville and got up to the mountains, and back then it took about seven hours because of two-lane roads and stuff. I turned the car over to Janie and climbed to the back of my AMC Gremlin where I laid the seats down. And, uh, you know, and I woke up, all of a sudden I was going, boom, 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 I mean, just rolling back and forth. And I went, what are you doing? I'm following that tra the trailer down the mountain. <laughs> she didn't know where she was going. She was following him. <laughs> Pull off. <laughs> Take it over. <laughs> you know, we don't like to follow sometimes. But we got to learn to trust the Lord. We got to learn to trust that God knows where he's leading you to. That God has a place and an enlarged encampment for you that he's leading you to. And though you can't see how you're going to get there, I am telling you that he's leading you into a place that flows with milk and honey. He's leading you into a land, a goodly land, and a godly land, and a blessed land, glory to God. That when you get there, you're going to rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Amen? And you may not know it all, but that's the walk of faith. You just follow him as he leads you. They that are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. Can you say amen? So he's omniscient. He knows everything. He knows that pothole's in the road ahead. He knows that situation's coming up. He knows you're, gonna, you're, you're about to deal with something that you don't want to deal with. But I want you to know he already has the answer in advance. Glory to God. And if you'll trust him, he'll get that answer will be manifest. And you'll walk through it and come out like the children of Israel. The, the three Hebrew children that came out of the fiery furnace. The ropes were burned off, but they didn't have the smell of smoke on them anywhere. Glory to God. Hairs on their head were not singed. Glory to God. I want you to know why. Because God knows what he's doing. Now, that doesn't mean the bad things are happening to you because God planned it. He knows where he's taking you, and stuff comes up, and he has an answer to deliver you from whatever comes to attack you. Yeah. Amen. Can you say glory? glory. Somebody say Shanda. 
So God is omniscient. He knows everything. Now, the, last, the fourth of the um, attributes that are ascribed to God, is ascribed to the Holy Spirit, is omnipotence. Fancy word for omnipower, all-powerful. Okay? Omnipotence. Luke one thirty five says, the angel answered her, and that's talking to uh, Mary, the Holy Ghost shall come on thee, and the power of the highest shall, over notice the same, the power of the highest, that is the power of God, uh, the Holy Ghost was going to come on her, and the power of, of the highest uh, shall overshadow thee, therefore the holy thing that shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. The power of the highest was, was manifest in, into her body by the Holy Ghost. Can you say Amen. So he is, is all-powerful like God. Why? Because he is God. I said the Holy Ghost is God. Glory to God. The, God manifests his power in the earth through the Holy Ghost. Glory to God. Can you say amen? So that's the last of the four, four attributes of God. Next, um, three distinctly divine works are attributed to the Holy Ghost. Now, if it's a divine work, it means it's God. Okay? Creation which has always been ascribed to God in the, God, in the beginning. Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Amen? And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved on the face of the waters, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. Psalm 104, verse 30 says this, Thou sendest forth thy Spirit, they are created then th and thou renewest the face of the earth. Now the Bible said that God created. Then it says the Holy Ghost was sent and created. Thank God. See, a work that's ascribed to God, the Father, is ascribed to the Holy Ghost. How can that be unless the Holy Ghost is God? God's not going to... He said, I share my glory with no man. I said, God doesn't share his glory with anybody. Somebody was talking about Brother Summerall the other day uh, on a Facebook thing, and they said, you know, they went to Brother Summerall after he had ministered one time. He said that, oh, somebody, hey, a, you're a great teacher. You're a great teacher. He went, and Brother Summerall did not mess around. I've been in his presence personally on, on, on several occasions. And um, he, as, as bold as he was in the pulpit, he's that same way in real life. Or was when he was here. He's, he's probably the same way in heaven. He's probably telling him where to put this and that. up. <laughs> He said, I'm not great. Exactly what was it? The Holy Spirit is great. Something about that era of ministry that we've lost with this arrogant cockiness of the new era is a dependency on God and the recognition that without his ability and without his power, we're nothing. We got so full of who we are that we forgot that we're nothing without him. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Without Christ, I can't do all things. I'm not somebody. I'm somebody in Jesus. Amen. We are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit and have no confidence in the flesh. Oh, thank God for God. Thank God for his spirit. Thank God the Holy Ghost is God. And so he creates... Uh, Job 33, 4, the Spirit of God made me, and the breath of the Almighty hath given me life. Who gave him life? God. Remember in Genesis, it says, God formed man for the dust of the ground and breathed unto him the breath of life, and he became a living soul? Isn't that, isn't that right? Romans 8, 11. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken or make alive your mortal bodies by what? By the spirit that dwelleth in you. Jesus said in John 6, 63, it is the spirit that makes alive. Quickeneth King James. Makes alive. Now, by, who, who gave life in the beginning? God. But the Bible here in the New Testament says the Holy Spirit gives life. What, how can that be unless... The Holy Spirit is, this is, this is a work. These are works that have always been uh, divinely attributed to God that the Bible attributes to the Holy Ghost. The authorship of divine prophecies. 
John, I mean, uh, first, uh, Second Peter one twenty one. For prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Um, praise God! Yeah, that make you say. Phew. Second Samuel 23, 2 and 3. The Spirit of the Lord spake by me, and his word was in my tongue. The God of Israel said, no, it's that the Holy Ghost spake by his tongue and said this, the God of Israel. Amen? Said the rock of Israel spake to me, he that ruleth over men must be just, ruling in the fear of God. Now, I was reading an article recently in one of them stupid Facebook posts where these dope dope brains get on there and write stuff. And articles in these new magazines, everybody's trying to read eight reasons why this, and nine reasons this, and ten reasons that, and they're all anti-church. We've got to be the new cutting-edge people. We can't have everything to do with church. Did you know that the church is not supposed to be cutting-edge and getting to the loss inside the building? Inside the church is the meeting place of the believer to train them up, to mature them, to equip them to go out there to where the world is and get them saved and bring them in to disciple them. The church is the discipleship training and, and, uh, and, and equipping house. We think, we act like it's a soul-saving station. It's not. I don't have any problem giving altar calls, but that's not our purpose. This is not a place that we try to get all the believers to to get them saved. We're to go get them saved and bring them here to get them discipled and grown up in Christ. Well, this guy was talking about homosexuality. And he was the right reverend such and such dodo brain. Because when they wrote Leviticus, you know, it was, it was not accepted that, you know, the only norm that they would accept is man and a woman. It wasn't until the 1800s that they began to accept that it could be normal for a man to be attracted to a man. That, so when the writers wrote that, they wrote that from their cultural perspective. What? Go turn in your right and your reverend. All right? Because the word says of itself that the men did not write by their will. They wrote as they were moved on by the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Ghost said that if a man lies with a man as with a woman, that it's an abomination. Not some man because of his culture. The Holy Ghost said. He said we did not write by the will of man. But as the Holy Ghost moved on them, they spake by the Spirit of God. They were being anointed by the Holy Ghost. He is the author of the Word. He is the author of divine prophecy. So write Dodo Brain. You ain't got educated beyond your intelligence. Because what he really said was, I don't ascribe to the fact that they wrote by the Spirit of God. Well, then you need to stop teaching the Bible. I said, you need to stop teaching the Bible. Because if you don't believe God breathed it, why are you teaching? This is God breathed. We don't get to pick and choose. We get to walk in accordance with the Spirit of God. Where he spoke and gave forth his God's word. And I don't know what he did with Paul. Of course, of course you know, saying we put it into the 1800s and all the writers of the Bible were writing from their culture. Because some cycle Bible comes along and says this is normal, doesn't make it normal. What about when they want to start marrying the horse? There's a woman who wants to marry her monkey or something. I mean, it's it just people want to marry a dolphin. They want to marry a dolphin. God established the union of marriage. He ordained it to be a certain way. And it doesn't matter what you say. And they were moved on by God to write those things. And the prophecies, they were moved on by God to write them by the spirit of the living God. Next verse, um, okay, the, uh, we see, Second Samuel says, the spirit of God spake by me. And his word was in my tongue. And this was the word, the God of Israel says. Thank God. I'm telling you, when you pick up this book, this is not a collection of a bunch of yo-yo brains and they all got together and created something. Like the Ron Hubbard guy and Dionytics or whatever it was, you know, which became Scientology. He just made it up. This is 66 books over thousands of years. With a common thread. When you start reading the prophecies of Jesus Christ and you look at that and go that he was a Bethlehemite, that he was, came out of Egypt, that he was a Nazarene. Hallelujah. How does all that take place? Because God orchestrated it. Hallelujah. And when did Jesus come? He came in the fullness of time. And every post-birth and post-resurrection 
concerning Jesus Christ that was prophesied except his return to pick up the church and to establish his kingdom has come to pass. Just like the scripture said. How? Because the God of all creation, the one who sits, see, God didn't you know, operate in the realm of time like we do. What Mark Brzee once said, he was here, he said, he said he heard a preacher say this one time, he said, God's like, you know, in the, he's, the, he's the hub of a spoke wheel. And he can look over here and go back in time, and he can look over there and go forward in time. He sees it all because he exists outside that realm. Are you here? And God saw man fall and took Jesus and had him slain from the foundation of the world, glory to God, and had the authors write prophecy after prophecy after prophecy after prophecy. What? Genesis 3.15 prophesied the virgin birth. The seed of the woman shall bruise your heel, and you shall bruise his head. He shall bruise your head, and you'll bruise his heel. Genesis 3.15 prophesied the virgin birth. Because women don't have seed. It was a supernatural birth. It was a virgin birth. It was a birth where God was the father. The Holy Ghost came on her. Her womb received Jesus, the living word. He was born into the earth. Prophesied in Genesis 3.15. Came to, and then Isaiah said, a virgin shall conceive. And see, Isaiah re reiterated it thousands of years later. Because the God who sits at the center of all time said, write this, write this, write this, and it would come to pass, come to pass, come to pass. The one who moved on men to write was God. And he wrote by divine, they wrote by divine inspiration. The prophecies of the scripture have come to pass. See, people still trying to figure out how Magog and Magog are all going to work out. You can't figure it out yet. When it comes to pass, you go, oh, okay. <laughs> Didn't see that one coming. Everybody remember, how many remember when Ronald Reagan was president? Ronald Wilson Reagan. He's the Antichrist. Because they were saying something about his name measured up six, six, six. They tried to have about several of our presidents the Antichrist. I could think of a couple that I probably would make, make, I kind of agree with them a little bit anyway, but I said a couple, so you can't take which one I'm talking about. All right? It's not going to be a president of the United States. It's going to be something from, from, from the, the, the Middle, Middle East. In that region of the world, and it's not going to come out of America. But the Holy Ghost divinely orchestrated the prophecies of Scripture. And men spoke as they were moved by the Spirit. Can you say glory to God? Again, 2 Peter 1.21, we'll leave here with this. For the Spirit, I mean, um, for the prophecy came down in old time by the will of man. But holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. These were not opinions of men. They was, these were divinely anointed to write and to speak the oracles of God. Can you say amen? amen. Next. Y'all with me? Statement. Can y'all turn that heat off? Did anybody tobacco farm this winter? Because they're going to get bring it in, hang it up in the rafters. It's hot. <clears throat> You're not hot? I'm hot. You're not hot. You're hot. All right. If you're not hot, come sit on the front of the stage here. We'll get you warm. Get right around them with them lights. I mean, throw out 300 watts right on you, baby. It'll get you warm. Statements which are in the Old Testament, distinctly, that distinctly oh, I'm sorry, statements which in the Old Testament that distinctly name the Lord or Jehovah as their subject are applied to the Holy Spirit in the New Testament. In essence, the Holy Spirit occupies the position of deity in New Testament thought. Okay? Two comparisons we're going to use here. One, Isaiah chapter 6. We can go ahead and look at uh, chapter, let's go to Isaiah chapter 6. I was going to pick up an A. We'll just go ahead and read 1 through 5. Isaiah 6. Come on. I love this passage. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon the throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims, each had two wings, six wings, two, two he covered his face, two he covered his feet, and two he did fly. And one cried unto the other, holy, holy, holy. Why do they say holy, holy, holy? Because there's Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Is the Lord of hosts, the whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, woe is me, 
For I am undone, because a man, I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. Then one flew one of the seraphims under me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken from the altar of off the altar, laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this has touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin is purged. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying unto me, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. And he said, Go, and tell this people, Hear ye, hear ye indeed, but understand, and see ye indeed, but perceive not. Make the heart of the people fat, and make their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and be converted, and be healed. Look with me, if you will, into Acts, the 28th chapter. We're making comparisons here. Now it says here, well, who was he talking to? We, he saw the Lord of hosts. Amen. Who's the Lord of hosts? God. Amen. The Lord of hosts. He saw the Lord of hosts high and lifted up in his glory. The glory of the Lord filled the temple. Oh, my, 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 my. You know, I, you know, I know people do a lot of cool things. They want to have smoke machines and all that kind of stuff in church. But I'll tell you what, folks. If we had the smoke of the Holy Ghost, you wouldn't need a smoke machine. Amen. You get the glory of God showing up in your services, and you don't need a you know, flashing light show. No, that's cool, and everybody kind of gets into it and thinks, because it feels you know, cool to coolness. But I'm telling you, I mean, there's nothing like the glory of the Lord showing up. I've, I've been, I have seen the glory. I've been in the glory. I've been in the fog, and I've been in the glory. The glory's better. I'm just going to tell you the truth. Fog smells funny. That stuff they use to make it, you know, put in that little fog machine. That's the, I'm the, the glory of the Lord. Oh, my, 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 my. I've seen it come into a room. Oh, my. Oh, ha, 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 there's nothing like the glory of the Lord manifest in a, in, 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 in a, in a service. Oh, what, what happens in people's lives, what God does for people, his, his presence is manifest like that. It's amazing. Hallelujah. Acts 28, 25. And when they agreed not among themselves, they departed after Paul had spoken one word, well spake the Holy Ghost by Isaiah the prophet. Now, wait a second. When we go back to Isaiah 6, it said it was God. Paul comes up here and says, well said the Holy Ghost. Well said the Holy Ghost by Isaiah the prophet unto our fathers, saying, go unto this people, and hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and not perceive. For the heart of this people is wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes have, have they closed. They see, see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with the heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. Well, didn't we just read in Isaiah that they, the, the place shook, and it was the whole earth was full of the glory, and he was in the presence of God Almighty, and the angels were crying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. And then God said these things, and he comes to the book of Acts, and then Paul writes and says, the Holy Ghost said. I said, the Holy Ghost said. Now, in Isaiah, it said God said it. In Acts, it says the Holy Ghost said it. What's that mean? The Holy Ghost has to be God. Can't be, he can't be anybody else. You can't interpret that any other way. Amen? Paul says in the New Testament that it was the Holy Ghost who spake. In the Old Testament, it was the Lord of hosts who spake. The God of glory. His whole, the whole earth is full of his glory. Hallelujah. And the angels are crying out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And then the voice of the hymn that spake was the Lord of hosts. And he said, he said, that, you know, go preach that the hearing they may hear. I mean, and, and, and with their eyes they may see, you know, and so forth. And then he comes back Paul says, the Holy Ghost said it. By Isaiah. So he tells you, he's not, it's not even mistaken that it was in some other book. He said, well, speak the Holy Ghost by the prophet Isaiah, saying. So in New Testament thought, they equated the Holy Ghost with God. Now, if it's good, like one woman told one time, she came up to uh, Brother Hagin. He had been saying, preaching and, and said a couple things. Well, the Greek says this and the Greek says that. And she came up to him after the service. I want you to know one thing. That if the King James was good enough for the Apostle Paul, it's good enough for me. I'm trying to be nice, but you just can't fix stupid. The King James translates was 1611. That's 1611 years after those guys were writing the scriptures in the Greek. If it was good. Well, here's one of those things. If the Holy Ghost is God, if Paul says the Holy Ghost is God, well, if it's good enough for the Apostle Paul, it's good enough for me. Amen? <clears throat> he said the Holy Spirit is God. Second comparison, look at this. Um, look over in Exodus. 
I'm going to read Exodus 67 and Hebrews, I mean, uh, Exodus 67, Psalm 95, okay? Exodus 67, in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord, for he that heareth your murmurings against the Lord, and what are we that ye murmur against us? Isaiah, I mean, um, Psalm 95, 8, harden not your heart. Now remember, one of the problems that the children of Israel ran into, they were stubborn and hard-hearted. And can I tell you something? That stubbornness and hard-hearted cost everybody that was over 20 years old their life. They never got to go into the promised land. Because when the 12 spies came back out, 10 brought back an evil report of the land, and two brought back a good, Joshua and Caleb brought back a good report. And the people rose up. They were going to try to kill Moses. They were so upset because they brought back an evil report, and they accepted the evil report over the good report. Remember, Joshua and Caleb tried to stand and steal the people and said, it is a good land that flows with milk and honey. Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able. And then the ten went, we be not well able. The giants in the land, the sons of Anak are in the land. And they've got walled cities. And the people began to murmur and to cry out all night long. And God got fed up with it and said, okay, everybody that believed that report, for the next 40 years, you're going to wander in this wilderness until you die. Your children will go in. You're not going in. You can get stubborn and hard-hearted and miss God. And God wrote to them and said, and then, and then prophets began to write after the children of Israel missed their inheritance. Had to pass it on to their children because they couldn't get it. See, they tried to go in later because they, oh, you know, and it didn't work. They had to wait until that whole generation died off. And what did they teach that children, those children all the time? Well, right here. This is one of the things they told them. Harden not your heart as in the day of provocation. What provocation? When they resisted the plan of God and hardened their heart against the will of God and the plan of God. As in the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, Proved me and saw my work. Forty years long was I grieved with this generation. You almost get the feeling God just couldn't wait for him to die so he could bring in a new generation. He was ticked off with them, what they did. He brought them out of it. The God of heaven delivered them supernaturally out of the land of Egypt. Brought them out with a dowry. The 400 years of captivity, he brought them out with a dowry. He drowned the entire Egyptian army in the midst of the sea. Mary and Eve had a song. We still sing it today. I will sing unto the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and the rider are thrown into the sea. We can still sing that song today, Miriam's song. They saw God do all that stuff, sent in 12 spies, and they see a couple of big dudes. Now, wait a second. If God can take and drown a whole army in the midst of the sea, what is a, a nine-foot guy going to do? Now, here's what, the, here back in Numbers 33, this is what the, the spies said. He, they said. They said, we were, were in our sight as grasshoppers. Then it goes on and says this, and so we were in their sight. Now, do a little more study. You'll find that when the children of Israel finally get over there, somebody asks them, what took y'all so long? They couldn't even enjoy the spoil because they knew they were coming. They'd heard the stories. News travels fast, even in those days. They heard the stories of how God had delivered the children of Israel out of Egypt. And then they're out there wandering around. They're all wondering, why are they walking around out there in the desert? They're coming to get us. He, he drowned the whole army in the sea. And somebody said, you know, the, the, the splitting of the Red Sea didn't really take, take place because there's no recording of it in Egyptian history. I wonder why. <laughs> you don't write that stuff down. We went after the slaves, they got out in the middle of the ocean, they got on the other side, and, we, and our whole army got wiped out. You don't put that down in history. It's called revisionist history. You leave the stuff out that makes you look bad. And we wonder, was there anybody left to even write about what happened? Because the whole army got drowned. We don't, know who got, we don't know who was left around to write about it. Of course it's not in their history. You don't, you, don't leave, you don't put stuff in that makes you look that bad. Are you here? You gone home. So harden not, harden not your heart. Okay? Well, who said this? When you tempted me, proved me, saw my work, 40 years was I grieved with that. Come on, thing. 40 years was I grieved with this generation and said, if that, if the, if it is a, I'm sorry, it is a people that do air wear in their heart 
as they have not known my ways, unto whom I swear in my wrath, they should not enter into my rest. Turn to Hebrews chapter 3. Now, this is God speaking about Israel. And then Hebrews chapter 3, verse 7. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith, today if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation, in the day of temptation, in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works 40 years. Well, this is a second thing where something was attributed to God that's now in the New Testament attributed to the Holy Ghost. You see, God said it in the Old Testament. Now in the New Testament, it says the Holy Ghost said it. This has to mean something. What does it mean? It means that the Holy Spirit is God. He's not a force. He's not a cosmic cloud. He's not some kind of guru floating around out there. He's not the, you know, the force be with you. I mean, it's none of that. He's not a metachlorian. Y'all seen Star Wars, you know, the, 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 the prequels came up and told you what the force was. It was metachlorians, uh, symbiont life beings that, that in, in, were all in us. And they all got together and kind of created the force. You now, God's a person. Manifests as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is not a force. He's not a cosmic energy pattern. He's not whatever. He, uh, he is a person. And not only is he a person, he's a divine person. He is God. Because in the Old Testament, they say God said it. In the New Testament, they say the Holy Ghost said it. Hallelujah. My, 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 my. <laughs> Hang with me. The name of the Holy Spirit is coupled with God in a way that can only infer deity. 1 Corinthians 4, 6. Now, there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. Who's that? Who's the Lord? Jesus. Amen? And, the, um, and there are differences, diversities of operations, but it's the same God that worketh all in all. We got the Spirit, we got the Son, and we got the Father all there in that same passage. Amen? Matthew 28, 19. Go ye therefore, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Remember when Paul came to Ephesus, finding certain disciples there, said, have you received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? Remember that? Paul, Paul having passed through the upper coast of Ephesus, finding certain disciples, said, have ye received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? And they went, we've not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And then Paul said, well, what were you baptized unto then? They said, we were baptized in John's baptism. John preached baptism of repentance indeed. But Jesus, and then he went on to preach that, and they all got baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Got filled with the Holy Ghost speaking in tongues. Amen. Glory to God. I said, glory to God. See, Jesus said, go teach and baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. I said, the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Now, they came along, they had gotten saved, but they just got, you know, they had some people who didn't have all the full revelation. John's baptism, that means baptism under repentance. They were preaching Jesus, but they didn't have that whole baptism thing down. When Paul came and said, you received the Holy Ghost since you believed, they said, we ain't even heard of the Holy Ghost. We well, didn't get baptized right then. Because if you'd been baptized right, you'd have heard of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Hallelujah. Next. 2 Corinthians 13, 14, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. The name of the Holy Spirit is coupled with God's in a way that can only infer he's divine. So I say glory to God. And last, well, almost last, the Holy Spirit is called God. That's pretty good. Acts chapter 5, verses 3 and 4. But Peter said, Ananias, why hath God, I mean, why hath God, why hath the God of this world, Beelzebub, Satan, Lucifer, fallen star, all right? Why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? Remember, they brought the money in, and they said, tell me whether you sold this man for so much. They said, yeah. And they said, why? And then Peter says, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? And to keep back part of the price of the land, while it remained, was it not your own? And after it was so, was it not in your own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in your heart? Because you lied not under men, but under God. Now, wait a second. Here, it says he lied to God. When you go back in the previous verse, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? He said, you didn't lie to God, man, you lied to God. He said, you lied to the Holy Ghost to start with. Then says, you didn't lie to man, you lied to God. The Holy Ghost is called God. Oh, he's, he's God. Now, he's worthy of worship. He's worthy of honor. He's worthy of respect. He's worthy to be entreated just like, I mean, oh, praise the Lord. Amen? 
Hallelujah. The Holy Spirit, by God's own word, is attributed to deity, worthy of worship, praise, fellowship, and honor. He's God, the third person of the Godhead. Romans 1.20, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Oh, hallelujah. The precious Holy Ghost. See? We, we all get saved, and we, we love Jesus. We receive Jesus. Everybody wants to receive Jesus. And you have to. You have to be born again. Yes. Book of Corinthians makes this very, uh, very interesting. Go to 1 Corinthians. Chapter 12, I believe. It's not that late. The Presbyterians haven't made it to the restaurant yet. Or maybe they have. Maybe they're already left. But you <laughs> Hallelujah. Come on, come on, come on. I'm trying to get there real quick. Now, remember when John the Baptist saw Jesus coming? Oh, I mean, he's preaching. He said this. He says, there's one who comes after me who's mightier than I. And he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Amen. See, Jesus preached the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But see, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 says in verse 12, for by one spirit, by the Holy Ghost, we're baptized into one body. What's that? Now you read the rest of it, you'll figure this out. When you get born again, you get baptized into the body of Christ by the Holy Ghost. And then after you get baptized in the body of Christ by the Holy Ghost, you're supposed to get baptized in the Holy Ghost by the Jesus, the head of the church. Remember, he that comes after me is mightier than I. He'll baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. But here it says that when you get born again, you're baptized by the Holy Ghost into the body. There's two separate things. They're not the same thing. I said they're not the same, they're not the same event. They're not the same experience. You cannot have the baptism of the Holy Spirit until you are baptized into the body of Christ. You have to be born again. But after that, after the Holy Ghost baptizes you into Jesus, Jesus will turn around and baptize you with the Holy Ghost. Get you born again, then get you filled. And even he told them, he said, go tarry in Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Glory to God. Remember, isn't it amazing? Paul said, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? Since you believed. Didn't say, so you could believe. He said, since you believed. Now, Acts 8 or whatever that is. I'm not sure exactly what it is. How Paul having passed through the upper coast of Ephesus, finding certain disciples there, said, hey, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? He accepted their testimony that they were in Christ. He said, you need to be filled with the Holy Ghost. He said, you need to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Why? So we can be witnesses. He said, the, the, he said go in Jerusalem until you be endued with power, dunamis, miracle power from on high. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Amen. And they, went to that, they went to that upper room and they stayed there until they got baptized in the Holy Ghost. And they came out men full of power. Remember, the Lord Jesus Christ himself was not equipped for ministry until the Holy Ghost came on him. When he was walking, well, he's God. Yeah, but he was walking as a man who stripped himself of his rights to deity and the glory. And in Luke, the fourth chapter, it says, and Jesus, remember, he got baptized in the River Jordan by John the Baptist. And the Holy Ghost descended upon him in a bodily form like as of a dove. And John said, uh, behold, the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. And a voice from heaven opened up and said, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And the Bible says, and Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being full of the Holy Ghost. After he spent 40 days in the desert, he was after the hunger. And uh, Satan came to him and tempted him with the three temptations, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. And the Bible says that he returned in the power of the Spirit. Every single believer needs to be, well, if you're, if you're a believer, you're born again. But every believer needs to be baptized in the Holy Ghost. You need to have what John the Baptist said Jesus was going to do for you. He was going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire after the Holy Ghost baptizes you into Jesus. Somebody say glory. <clears throat> glory. Hallelujah. I said glory. They even got in one place, got it mixed up. They got baptized with the Holy Ghost before they got baptized with water and said, see, can you prevent water? See, these men receive the Holy Ghost as well as we. They got them born again, baptized the Holy Ghost, then baptized them in water. Amen. Amen. I said, God, God's out to get people filled, filled up with himself every way he can get them filled up with himself. Once you're born again, once you're filled with the Spirit, once you're empowered to do the work of the kingdom, glory to God, once you're going out doing good works for Jesus, praise God, can you say amen? And when we recognize that the Holy Spirit is a divine, supernaturally divine being who is God, 
who takes his rank in the Godhead as the third person. God the Father is first, God the Son is second, and God the Holy Ghost is third. But they make up the Godhead in a unique trinity that we don't quite understand in the natural cognitive mind, but in spiritual matters, spiritual things are more real than natural things. And just because you can't figure it out don't mean it's real. Just because you can't put God in a test tube and prove he exists doesn't mean he's not real. That's why we walk by faith and not by sight. Oh, hallelujah. Father, we thank you for the word. Thank you for the presence of the precious third person of the God ahead, the Holy Ghost. Thank you that he manifests himself in a supernatural, divine way, glory to God, and makes real unto us you, your word, hallelujah, so that we're equipped for the kingdom's business. Equipped to carry out the purpose and will of God. Hallelujah. Father, per adventure, there be one among us today that does not have the Lordship of Jesus Christ in their life. Or someone's backslid, not walking with God. Or even yet, Father, they're born again but don't have, the, have not received yet the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Move upon the hearts this morning. Let them know the reality being saved, being restored, and being filled. May they come into the fullness of your spirit. Hallelujah. In the fullness of all that you have for them. May they all walk in the full and complete counsel and wisdom, purpose of God. In Jesus' mighty name, we ask that to be so. As the heads are bowed, I'm going to give offers of, of, uh, this morning. I ask God to minister to people on those three veins. If you're not saved, if you're backslidden, or if you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. If you've not yet received Jesus Christ as the Lord of your life, raise your hand. I want to pray with you. Glory to God. If you're backslid, not walking with God, you know you should be. Would you raise your hand? I want to pray with you. If you've not yet received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, would you raise your hand? I want to pray with you. One way they got people filled with the Holy Spirit was they lay hands on them. They got filled with the Holy Ghost. That's part of our ministry. With their hands, but they get filled with the Holy Ghost. Glory to God. We trust that you were blessed by the Word of God and the flow of the Spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or using our mailing address, P.O. Box 7752, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27417. If you would like to contribute to our ministry, please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the Giving Online button. Thank you, and may God richly bless you for your giving.